Welcome to the Worship Center in Bryan's Road, Maryland, where Jesus is saving lives, saving souls, and saving futures. Now here's Dr. Steve Davis with wisdom tips, life treats, and gold nuggets from God's Word. Have you ever felt like you just don't fit in? Or maybe if not just a feeling, maybe people have told you all your life that you don't fit in, you don't belong, you're not like them. You know, sometimes you can know you're different and it makes you feel like maybe there's something wrong with you somehow. You know, and it, and it could have been somebody on the outside. It could have been a parent who made you wonder if you even belong to the family. I used to wonder about that. You know, or a teacher or kids on the playground who teased you for being different. And you know, for some of us, it's been that they're are just some things that we can't do very well. You know, things that seem easy for everybody else somehow, but we can't do it. You know, we just can't do those things as easily or as well as other people, and we feel rejected or dumb for it. You know, I felt like that for a lot of my life, and it's really not that uncommon. You know, some of us spend most of our lives trying to figure out where and how we fit in. We have this sense of misplaced identity and wondering who we really are and what we're meant to be and what could we be and what are we meant to do with our lives? The other night, I was going through the guide, just scrolling through the guide on my TV, trying to find something that could catch my attention and be worth watching. You know, and I'm scrolling through the descriptions of some of the different shows and movies. And it was amazing to me how many were described like this, like a band of misfits is drawn together to save the earth from an alien invasion. Nope, already seen that one. A deadly virus is unleashed on the earth and the only ones who can save the world are a group of renegade scientists and a misfit doctor. A crime wave sweeping New York City and the police chief calls out a group of misfits and brings them back to the NYPD to save the city. I even saw one where it said a city doctor retires to a small New England village where he is a misfit veterinarian until a strange disease begins to attack all the animals in town. You know, I hadn't realized how many shows and movies are built around misfits or oddballs or whatever you want to call them and how valuable they really are. The two definitions of misfit are first, something that's the wrong size or shape for its purpose. And two, a person who is unable to adjust to their environment or circumstances or is considered to be too different from others. So because of that, it's pretty easy to feel like a misfit, like we just can't seem to fit in and we try and fail, we try to adapt and we can't. So many times we just then decide to play along and pretend like we're just like everybody else just to keep the peace. You know, I've always been different. I used to pray and ask God, why couldn't I be like all the other preachers? Why can't I be like everybody else? And he told me that it's because he created me to reach people and do things in their lives and bring them things from God that no one else would bring them. And that settled it for me. And I want to tell you, if you're a misfit, if you feel like a misfit, or have ever been called a misfit, you're in pretty good company. I was reading in the book of 1 Samuel in the Bible, and it was talking about a group of guys that were being led by David before he was king. King Saul, the current king, was wanting to kill David, and David had already been anointed to be king by the prophet Samuel, but David wasn't in the office of king yet. You might relate to that. You know, maybe God called you to do something, and it could have been many years ago. And it hasn't happened yet, but you still feel called. You know, what can you do? What do I do until then? Just keep being obedient and faithful and keep learning and growing and trusting in God's timing. So there in 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 2, it describes the team that David had with him. Not exactly a bunch of heroes. Nope. They were much more like a bunch of misfits. They, in fact, they sound like some of the groups of misfits that Hollywood has put together for their epic movies about odd, unqualified, eccentric people coming together to do something really significant in saving humanity. It says in 1 Samuel chapter 22 and verse 2 that everyone that was in distress, everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves around David. There's a 3D vision for you. And he became captain over them, and there were with him about 400 men. So David's wanting to lead his people to victory, and all he had to work with were people who were down on their luck, people that were broke, people who were in debt. And that's the people that God had given David to lead and to work with. And the Bible says they were distressed. Like I said, they were broke in debt. They owed money. They were discontented. 
And that's not really the way I'd want to be described. You know, distressed means having anxiety or mental suffering or severe strain resulting from exhaustion or an accident. Debt, nobody needs to define that for us. We all know that one. And most of us know pretty well what that means. Discontent means to feel restless, to have a desire or a craving for something that you don't have, to be dissatisfied and displeased. You know, I don't think there's anyone who doesn't fall into at least one of those three categories from time to time, or even all three of them at the same time. I know I've been there. So many people are distressed and filled with stress, anxiety, and worry. And I don't know anyone who isn't in some kind of debt, even if they talk big. A lot of God's people are in financial bondage and they can't pay their bills. The debt collectors are chasing them down and calling them and harassing them. And there are those who are just discontent, restless, wanting more, wanting something different, dissatisfied, not even sure what you do want. You know, and there there are church people like that running from one church to another looking for something different, but they don't know what it is. And what catches my attention here in this first chapter, in 1 Samuel chapter 22, is how do you take a group of people who are broke, busted, and disgusted and turn them into a mighty, unified, and effective force? How do you get these kinds of folks to find and fulfill their destinies? How did these people who are misfits become so effective? How did they find their purpose? How did they find their destiny? Well, we're going to look at that. It's a pretty quick little lesson today. First of all, they came together and they discovered a purpose that they all had in common, common purpose. They wanted to defeat King Saul and make David king. They knew that God had told the prophet Samuel to anoint David as the next king, and they wanted to be part of what God was doing. And what changed them is that they set all their smaller differences aside and they worked together for a purpose bigger than themselves and their desires. They were willing to do anything and everything to help David get to the throne because they knew that was what God's plan was. They were willing to be inconvenienced, to be talked bad about, to be rejected, and to risk everything in order to bring the change that was needed. That's what brought them together. You know, they weren't unified because they were all alike or they all liked the same food or they all dressed the same way or liked the same sports teams or listened to the same kinds of music or anything like that. They became effective because they were all involved in bringing to pass the will of God for their lives and families. That's the same principle today. Jesus prayed in John's Gospel, chapter 17, that we would be unified, that we would be as one. We want to save lives, to save souls, and to save futures, to help people get off the drugs and alcohol, to come to know the Lord Jesus in a real and personal way, and to have a hope and to have a future in life. There's a special anointing, a special presence of the Holy Spirit when God's people come together to reach and help and save other people. When we give ourselves 100% to the Lord and to reaching the people he's put in our lives, there's a special anointing upon that. That's the key thing, to know the Lord and to make him known. And when that's what we're about, God honors it and he brings his blessing and his presence in a very deep and powerful way. So, First, they came together for a common purpose that was bigger than any of them. Second, they rallied around each other. They supported each other. They looked after each other. They defended each other. They protected each other. And that's not the way it is in life, in society, or even in many churches. But that's the key. The Bible says in the book of Acts, chapter 2, that the disciples, 120 of them, were gathered in one place and in one accord, and they were praying. Then the place where they were was shaken and the Holy Spirit came down upon all of them. If we want to take distressed, debt-filled, discontented people and turn them into an incredible force, we have to love each other and live for the Lord with each other and support each other. You know, Jesus said, by this will everyone know that you're my disciples if you love one another. So this random group of men did exactly that. They defended each other. They fought for each other instead of fighting with each other. They recognized and attacked the correct enemy. They didn't fight each other. They fought the one enemy. You know, someone said that this is why so many churches are divided and gossipy and fragmented. Jesus called us to be fishers of men, and when fishermen don't fish, they fight. And we need to be reaching broken and hurting people with the good news 
gospel of Jesus Christ. People need to hear that and know about it and experience. Because not only did these guys have a common goal they had together, they also had a common enemy. We have to understand that the enemy we're fighting isn't fellow church members. It's not our neighbors. It's not the government. It's not other people in our neighborhoods or in our city or in our country. The Bible says that our fight isn't with flesh and blood, but it's against principalities, against the rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. Flesh and blood, that's not your enemy. It's spiritual. And we've got to move from telling people, watch your back, to letting them know, I've got your back. I'm here to support you. You know, some of us have come from a long way off and have issues that we've been dealing with for too long. Things like depression and thoughts of suicide and various addictions and struggles and problems, various hurts and pains. We don't need more criticism and judgmentalism. We need someone who will encourage us and care about us and pray for us and pray with us and to help us become everything God wants for us to become. We need someone who will stand with us and help us against those things we can't deal with by ourselves. And that's a key principle in the family of God is that we care about each other. We stick together and we support and help and pray for each other. And then number three, they were willing to engage in making the difference that was needed. They didn't just want to sit around and talk about it or complain about it. And these people didn't have much going for them as individuals. But when they were united, they were determined to reach out and engage and protect people from being abused and destroyed by King Saul and his forces. Listen, like them, we're outnumbered, but people still need our help. They still need to hear that there's a God who loves them and a Jesus who died for them and that a life has been purchased for them on the cross by the blood of Jesus, a life that's better than anything they've ever experienced before. And it's there for the asking, if they only know about it. If we're, if we're going to see folks who are broken, devastated, bitter, used up, and misfit become all that they're destined to become, then we need to stand up, and we need to speak up, and sometimes we need to act up. We need to be a voice for those with no voice and a protection for those who have no strength. And it isn't easy, and it doesn't happen overnight, but I can tell you it's worth it. People are hurting. People are waiting for somebody who will listen and someone who will speak and someone who will give them a hand up. Most of us have been hurt by other people. I know I have. Most of us have been hurt by leaders even. And then there's parents and teachers and family members, and the church needs to be a safe place where we can come and find hope and help and strength to deal with the things that have happened and for many of us are still happening in our lives. When Jesus walked the earth, his followers could be described the same way. The crowds that followed Jesus were full of people who'd been hurt in life, and they were misfits, they were discontented, they were broke, they were broken. And Jesus is still calling to people today, calling us out, people who've been misused and abused and mishandled. And I can also tell you that your past doesn't equal your future. What you're running from isn't as important as what you're running to and who you're running to. I know I had to quit consulting my past to find my future. I had to move beyond my hurts and open my heart to be everything that God wants me to be. And it's the same for you. It's the same for everyone. Jesus said, whoever comes to me, I will not turn away. And I believe that we can take all the misfits that God has given us already and those he will send in the future and with God's help and each other's caring and each other's help and support, God can and will do great things through us and in us. And I believe that for you. I believe that you're a person who's been through many things, but I also believe it's given you a heart for people and an understanding of the pain that so many people go through. And I believe God is going to use you to bring his love and his hope and his salvation to them and their circle of friends and their circle of loved ones. And I pray that God's blessed you with this message today and that you'll give us a thumbs up, a little th thing of, hey, I listened, I liked it, it ministered to me, it blessed me. I pray that you subscribe if you haven't already and that you'll share this message with someone that God has put on your heart who will be blessed by it. I really appreciate the time you take to spend with me, to hear some of the things God has given me. And as always, I ask you to pray for me. I always need it and totally appreciate it. We hope you were blessed, inspired, and challenged by what you heard today. And we pray that God spoke some inspired truths into your heart. 
This ministry is supported by your gifts and donations. If you'd like to help us spread the good news, you can give at our website, www.theworshipcenter.org, or you can text to give at 301-637-0777. It's easy and takes only seconds to set up. Thank you for listening and God bless you and your family.